And welcome to the Hot Rod Bible Study, where tonight we're coming to you live via remote from my producer director's home, Jim Sheridan. And hopefully that will uh, alleviate some of the uh, technical difficulties that we've been experiencing over the last couple of weeks. Uh, it's a nice day out here in uh, Chino Valley, Arizona. We've had some electrical uh, activity in the sky, so... Uh, we're just going to give her a good shot here. Uh, tonight we are in chapter 14 of Revelation. And it's under the heading of the Lamb and the 144,000. So let's, let's pray and go after it. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this time we get to share together and being in your word. We thank you for your word. We thank you. Thank you that you love us as much as you do, even though we we don't deserve it, Lord. Thank you so much for that. And uh, open our hearts and minds to your word tonight. Send your Holy Spirit upon us. And I sound like a broken record, Lord, but I mean it. Keep me out of the way. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. That's an old term all of a sudden, isn't it? A broken record. How many... <laughs> I, I don't know if my grandchildren understand what that means. So with that, uh, let's start in verse 1 where it says, Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of loud thunder, and I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sang as if it were a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were the redeemed among men, being firstfruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they were, without, they were without fault before the throne of God. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. And worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives a mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are those are the dead and who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Then I looked and behold, a white cloud and on that cloud one sat, sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. And the other angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. 
Then another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, and he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire. And he cried with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth, gathered the vine of the earth, and threw it into the winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city, and the blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs. That's a bunch. Okay, as you probably understand, this one has a quite a bit of allegory, which... Again, what's the deal that we have with Revelation? We have the reason we have issues with trying to understand it. A lot of times it's reading too much into it, and a lot of times it's reading too little. Always remember, the book of Revelation speaks to what was, what is, and what is to come. Okay, so now here we are. Verse 1, when it says, where it says, Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000. Okay, who is this lamb? Obviously, this is Jesus. Mount Zion um, pretty much uh, is um, the city of Jerusalem, okay, the city on the hill, so Mount Zion. Okay, and with him were the 144,000. We last saw the 144,000 in chapter 7 at the beginning of the tribulation. And here we see them again during this time. Um, there are 144,000 Jewish believers who have come to know Jesus as the Messiah. And why are they there? Well, having his fathers... Jesus' Father's name written on their foreheads, not the mark of the beast that everybody is being required to do during the tribulation. Uh, Spurgeon also mentions that um, not only that, it doesn't have a B on their foreheads for Baptists, nor does it have a W on their forehead for Wesleyans. And I'd like to add, nor does it even have an N on there for non-denominational. <laughs> It has the mark we have. They have the mark of the Father. And it, there was a guy that I listened to some years ago who spoke of how he had this dream where uh, he was asked if Jesus came back today, would he go to a Roman Catholic church? And the answer was, well, sure. You know, the church universal, the first, you know, the first, well, actually the second established Christian church. And would they go there? Sure. And it's, well, how about the Lutheran Church? Oh, yeah, because Luther straightened out the troubles with the, with the Roman Catholic Church. Well, how about the Baptists? Well, yeah, they're pure. They're going to be doing all this stuff. Well, how about the Pentecostals? Oh, yeah, they're full of the Spirit. And finally he said, no, Jesus wouldn't go to any one of them. Why? Because whatever church he would go to, what would we do who attended that? We got it right. No, no, no. Jesus asked us to come to him. And that's what we will do. Okay, his father's name written on their foreheads. Again, not the Baptists or the Wesleyans or the non-denons. Yeah, that sounds good. Anyway, going on. Jim's being nice to me. He's getting me some water. He said, I wanted a drink, and I didn't know what he meant. Okay, verse 2. And I heard a loud voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of of loud thunder. Okay, the loud thunder. One of the uh, different translations calls it a peal of thunder, uh, a streptus, a loud noise. Mm, And I heard the sound of the harpists playing their harps. Uh, Again, stringed instruments, as we saw the four elders having in uh, back in Chapter 5, uh, my good friend Ed Ray, Pastor Ed Ray, uh, likes to say that actually they're stringed instruments and they'll be playing guitars in heaven. He likes playing guitar. 
But anyway, okay, these are the things that are going on. And here it says, they sang as it were a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. Uh, beyond the comprehension of those whose uh, souls are earthbound, those who are not accepting the mark of the Father. Okay. Verse 4. These are the ones who are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Uh, they're the ones who are not, uh, haven't committed spiritual adultery. Now, if we're, if, if you were with us for our study in Hosea, you'll, you'll remember a bit of that. And I'd like to, uh, this is a good try. Thank you. <laughs> we're just having a ball here tonight. We're just hoping this thing's complete playing. Anyway, um, in the book of Hosea, please turn with me to chapter four. And we're going to read 11 through 14, where it says, Harlotry, wine and new wine enslave the heart. My people ask counsel from their wooden idols, and their staff informs them. For the spirit of harlotry has caused them to stray, and they have played the harlot against their God. They have offered sacrifices to the mountaintops and burned incense on the hills under oaks, poplars, and terebinths, since because their shade is good. Therefore, your daughters commit harlotry, and your brides commit adultery. I will not punish your daughters when they commit harlotry, nor your brides when they commit adultery, for the men themselves go apart with the harlots and offer sacrifices with ritual harlots. Therefore, people who do not understand will be trampled. Okay, this is the deal. Those in, in Hosea's time, this whole thing is showing how uh, God's people were committing spiritual adultery with other gods. Same thing here. They were not defiled by, by this spiritual adultery. These are the ones who follow the lamb wherever he goes. Again, the 144,000. These are redeemed from among men, being first fruits of God in the Lamb. First fruits, we hear about that a lot. And really what this is, is a sacrifice that's offered to the Lord with thanksgiving. Okay, always when they had, they were, had the harvest, they gave the first fruits to God. This is what these are, okay? And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they're without fault before the throne of God. They were the ones who chose not to worship the beast. Okay, no deceit in their mouths. Verse 6, Then I saw another angel, angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth. The everlasting gospel, the good news that goes on forever, everlasting. And here's something that I find very interesting. Uh, it says, to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Think about that. Preaching the everlasting gospel to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. I think this addresses those who say, well, what about this tribe that's, you know, off in some far off uh, desert island or something like that who's never heard of Jesus? How is God going to be so mean that he will, he will send them to hell? By the way, God never sends anybody to hell. Uh, it's done on your own choice. He wants no one <laughs> to die. It's under your own choice to go to hell. God does not send people there. But there it is. It says right here that there will be every nation, tribe, and tongue, and people. There it is. There's that opportunity. 
It says, Sing with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. And worship Him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the springs of water. Now, not only uh, announcing the uh, everlasting gospel, but also announcing the judgment. Okay. And, uh, you know, it does, it, uh, that, uh, pardon me, the judgment that all will fear God and give him glory. Uh, where is that? Well, let's look at Philippians chapter 2. I'm going to start at the ninth verse. I think you may have heard this before. I hope you have, because this is what it is. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name, which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every, there's the word, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every, there's that every again, Tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The key here is your timing. <laughs> if you've yet to do that, and if all of a sudden we have the rapture, guess what? You're going to be left behind. <laughs> Pretty simple. Okay, now. Verse 8 goes on to say, And another angel followed, saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Again, intoxicated with sin. Now, let's, let's look at a note I have here on Babylon. Walverd writes, Prophetically, Babylon sometimes refers to a literal city. Sometimes a religious system. Get that. Sometimes a religious system. Remember, you're not saved by religion. You're saved by a relationship with Jesus. Sometimes to a political system. Huh. All stemming from the evil characteristic of historic Babylon. So that's why it's read out that way. Babylon has fallen. Verse 9 goes on to say, Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his, meaning the beast's mark, on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into a cup of his indignation. Okay, uh, Guzik puts it this way about the mark. Although receiving the mark may seem innocent enough to those who dwell on the earth, in their eyes it may not seem uh, much like, like much more than a mere pledge of allegiance and devotion to the Antichrist and his government. It was the same way in the first centuries of Christianity when to burn a pinch of incense to the image of Caesar which was required, and to pledge Caesar as Lord, was regarded as just an innocent act of civic duty to the ancient pagans. Okay. We don't want to be doing that. Okay. And it talks about that he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. What? What is this cup? We hear about taking this cup. Well, let's look at Jeremiah 25. And verses 15 and 16, where it says, Thus says the Lord God of Israel to me, Take this wine cup of fury from my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send you to drink it. And Asia will drink and stagger and go mad because of the sword that I will send among them. Again, the cup of judgment. Now, you may have also heard this uh, with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Matthew 26, verse 39. He went a little further 
and fell on his face and praying said, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. That cup of judgment Jesus took for us so that those of us who have surrendered our lives to him do not have to take that cup. Very good. He shall be tormented. He who has to take this cup of God's indignation shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends, how long? Forever and ever. Not just for a week or two, forever and ever. And they will have no rest day or night, who worship the beast in his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Okay, you know, there are those, maybe some of you who are watching this, who believe that there is no such thing as hell. Well, I think this describes it pretty well, that their torment ascends forever and ever, have no rest day or night. Hell is a real place. And again, God does not send anybody to hell. He would not want anybody to go to be sent there. But he has given us free will, and so it's by our own free will. <laughs> it's by your own free will if you're going to hell. Real simple. And the torment goes on forever and ever. Verse 12 goes on to say, here's the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then I heard from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may what? Rest from their labors and their works follow them, which is exactly the opposite of the torments in hell. Uh, Jim and I are just talking tonight. He and I both are kind of dragging, just a little bit on the tired side. And man, <laughs> I guess you come by it a little bit easier when you, you're north of 60. And, uh, but we all have experienced exhaustion. And just think, you will get no rest day or night if you are in hell. But in heaven, you may rest from your labors. How about that? Sounds like the place I'd rather be. Verse 14 goes on to say, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown. And here comes my uh, Spurgeon quote of the evening, which I think you'll go along with me. It's pretty neat. How different it will be to see him with a crown of gold on his head, from what it was to see him wearing that terrible crown of thorns that the cruel soldiers plated and thrust upon his brow. The word used here does not usually refer to a diadem, a crown of power, but to the crown won in conflict. Okay, And it is very remarkable that it should be said that when Christ comes to judge the world, he will wear the garland of victory, the crown which he has won in the great battle which he fought. How significant of his final triumph that he will, that a crown of gold will be about those brows that were once covered with the bloody sweat when he was fighting the battle for our salvation. Wow, he did fight that battle. Can you just imagine? Again, I, I, I go over this time and time again. Just imagine the sufferings and death. And and we go about this every Every year on Good Friday, I like to read what crucifixion truly is and what a terrible thing it was and how Roman citizens, uh, you didn't have to suffer that because it was saved for the worst of the worst. You think about what Jesus did to pay the price for my sins, your sins. Wow. It, it's just mind-boggling. Okay. 
Now, and on his hand a sharp sickle, which is indicating harvest time. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him, who sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle in on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Joseph Seiss, who I've been reading more from, puts it this way. It must be remembered that evil has its harvest as well as good. Huh. There is a harvest of misery and woe, a harvest for the gathering, binding, and burning of the tares, as well as for the gathering of the wheat into the garner of heaven. There is a harvest. Verse 17, Then another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar who had the power over fire, and he cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vines of what? The earth, we're talking about those who are not saved. For her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the wine press of the wrath of God. And the wine press was trampled outside the city and the blood came up out of the wine press up to the horse's bridles for 100 for, pardon me, 1,600 furlongs, which is approximately 200 miles. Uh, another vivid picture of judgment. The things that I don't think anybody within the sound of my voice wish to experience, but those who turn their back on Christ will. Talks about the grapes are fully ripe. And it says, he gathered the vines of the earth and threw to the grain great wine press. Okay. Think of the battle hymn of the Republic. And here's verse. It says, mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vineyard where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible, swift sword, his truth is marching on. Again, a picture of the coming judgment. Uh, it's one good thing that, that, well, it's one of the many good things that we have studying the book of Revelation here. It makes us really have some introspection on what is to happen to those who turn their back on Jesus. Now, I would like, I would like to hope that everybody within the sound of my voice has already, uh, surrendered their lives to Jesus. But I bet you that there is somebody that you know who has not. And time is of the essence. Time is of the essence. It's back to what do we do with the book of Revelation? It, you know, there's so many, so many of these different ideas. Well, we need to be looking out for this. We need to be looking out for that. Really what it's saying is be prepared. The key of the book of Revelation is what do you do with Jesus, which is the key to salvation. It's up to you. It's up to our loved ones. What do they do? Again, we're called to be witnesses. We're not called to be attorneys. But it is my prayer that everyone within the sound of my voice, those who have surrendered to Jesus, that they speak with love to their loved ones and their friends. And for those of you who have yet to surrender your life to Jesus, I pray that you do that in earnest soon. And guess what? It is more freeing. You know, <laughs> you know, we never think of surrendering as being freeing. We always think of surrendering and getting put in prison. No, no, they're the opposite. This kind of surrender frees us from the prison of sin. All right. Questions, comments, smart aleck remarks. I see none. Again, I 
please, if you have anything, any questions, please get in contact with me. There's a number of ways through Facebook, through www.hotrodbiblestudy.com. Uh, you probably might even have my telephone number. I, 951-317-0680. I am happy to speak to anybody because my desire is for all my friends and loved ones and everyone within the sound of my voice that you know Jesus as your Savior. And with that, may God bless you with a wonderful evening, a wonderful night, and just wrap your loving arms around you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.